sermons because she probably hasn't seen them all or heard them all. So you can message that. But make sure you check out our YouTube channel. And if you miss a message there, uh, they, they're there unless we have technical difficulties, which we do have here in our church. Um, so the story I want to tell you this morning is uh, ties in with my message. Um, you know, right now in this season, I don't know if you know this, but uh, if you're a gym attender member on a regular basis, like we are, it's a really annoying time of the year, right? You don't even want to go to the gym for the first eight days because everybody has to flush out their New Year's resolutions and then quit. And so like by June, January 9th, it's a good time to come back and get back into the swing of things. Um, but, but as each year goes by, a lot of people are just very reflective, let's put it that way. Coming into the new year, you probably heard this phrase, new year, new you. Well, I want to tell you a story about what's more likely reality. So we were out snowmobiling the other day, and uh, my brother and I, Mark, were going to go get gas, and before we left, I was going to tell him, because how many of you know this Sunday looks a lot different than last Sunday here in Minnesota? I was going to tell him I'm going to stay high the whole way. I'll just stay high, stay away from the ditches. Not a lot of people had been out already. So we made it to Coborns, and we filled up with gas, and we were heading back. We got to the dealership, and like a moth to the flame, <laughs> like a snowmobiler who hasn't seen this much snow in 30 years. Care 11 said it's the, the snowiest start to winter in 30 years. I was just drawn to this deep four feet snow, whatever it was with all of the um, snow plow going by, and I knew I was about to be stuck like I'd never been stuck before, and those of you maybe saw the picture on Facebook, it was, it was like, this might be where it dies, like we might leave it here and have someone else come get it, and so um, my, my boys came, and we were standing there looking at it, and actually Taylor came up with the idea of how we could pat it down and get it out, and it actually went really well. I was very surprised because I was envisioning calling Steve to come rescue me because that's one of the things he does. And I sent him a picture right away just to pre-qualify him, like you might be coming this way. Um, but, but if you noticed all week, lots of people were stuck. Did you see that? Like, like our plow guy this week here at the church got stuck. And I watched it happen in real time. He was pushing the snow across the parking lot, trying to put a little bit in the grass. And I watched the truck go like this, and I go, he's not going anywhere anymore. So we had to go out and rescue him and get him out. And there was these stories that you would see, like people just trying to go downtown to the post office, and they hadn't plowed very much on Main Street. And there they sat. They were stuck. And I was thinking about that as I was looking over our text today in Deuteronomy chapter 30, and I was thinking about all week long, we have seen people in the ditch, we've seen people stuck, we've seen people in these situations where they were physically stuck in a location. That happens not as much as it used to maybe, but maybe this year is going to be one of those years. But the reality is this, there are many people who are also stuck in life. The years go by and nothing changes. They, they have no sense of change in their life. In fact, I believe that the older that we get, the more stubborn sometimes we get about change. And here's the reality. Many times, this is what I'm starting to observe, as you get older in life, you reach your middle years, all of a sudden, you are starting to reap the culmination of all the choices and decisions you've made over your whole life. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses is about to die. He's, he's at the end of his life, and the Lord is giving, he's downloading to Moses these final things that he wants Moses to communicate to the children of Israel before they go into the promised land. And if you look at your Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 30, it may so say something like this, just across the title. Choose life. Choose life. And, and it got me to thinking about how sometimes we are our own worst enemies. 
Because ultimately in life, you are a culmination of the choices and the decisions that you have made thus far, for good or bad. Now, hear me this morning. God can redeem that. So if you've made some bad choices, God can redeem that. But ultimately, the older that you get, the more you realize that you are just a culmination of the choices and the decisions that you have made. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1, we pick up what Moses is speaking to the children of Israel, and he says this. In the future, when you experience all these blessings and curses I have listed for you, and when you are living among the nations to which the Lord your God has exiled you, take to heart all these instructions. If at that time you and your children return to the Lord your God, and if, everybody say if, if you obey with all your heart and with all your soul all the commands I have given to you today, then the Lord God will restore your fortunes. He will have mercy on you and gather you back from all the nations where he has scattered you. Even though you are banished to the ends of the earth, your Lord God will gather you from there and bring you back again. The Lord your God will return you to the land that belonged to your ancestors, and you will possess that land again. Then he will make you even more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. Verse 6, the Lord God will change your heart and the hearts of all your descendants so that you will love him with all your heart and soul, and so you may live. The Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and those who hate and persecute you. Then you will again obey the Lord and keep all his commands that I am giving you today. The Lord your God will then make you successful in everything you do. He will give you many children and numerous livestock. He will cause your fields to produce abundant harvests. For the Lord will again delight in being good to you as he was to your ancestors. The Lord your God will delight in you if, everybody say if, if you obey his voice and keep the commands and decrees written in the book of instruction. And if you turn to the Lord your God, God with all your heart and soul. This command I am giving you today is not too difficult for you to understand and it is not beyond your reach. In other words, no excuses. God, you don't know my past. You don't know my family. You don't know what I've gone to. Mm -mm, no excuses. It is not kept in heaven to, so distant that you must ask who will go up to heaven and bring it down so we can hear it and obey it. It is not kept beyond the sea so far away that you must ask who will cross the sea to bring us what we can hear and obey. No, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart so that you can obey it. Verse 15, now listen. Today, I am giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love your Lord, the Lord your God and to keep his commandments decrees and re regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you and the land you are about to enter and occupy. When I said before that you look around the world, you look at people today, and not only are they sometimes stuck physically, but more importantly, they're stuck spiritually, the Bible actually tells us that that's the reality. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, the Bible says this, There is a way which seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses is painting out for the children of Israel something very, very clear. And that is the choice for life and death, for blessing and curses, stand before you. Choose wisely. 
Now, as much as we like to kind of think about grace, which is very, very important, I think sometimes we forget that we have the decisions and the choices to make that can harm us or help us. Would you agree? You know, hopefully you don't need a TV commercial to tell you today that smoking is bad for you or that drinking and driving is bad for you or that whatever sort of uh, company that's trying to profit from bad things has to tell you in plain sight. Hopefully you know that. But sometimes there are deeper things that we have to consider. Sometimes we have to go deeper and really ask ourselves this question. As it stands right now in my life, on the cusp of a brand new year, how, are, how am I going about making the choices and the decisions for my life and for the life of my family? Where does that wisdom come from? Because there are no easy things in life. There's no easy decisions. There's no easy choices. Sometimes there's very simple, easy decisions. If you're a Bears fan or a Vikings fan, easy choice. Be a Bears fan. But there are more complex things. Maybe you're here today and you're worried about your finances right now. Maybe you're worried about your job situation. Maybe you're worried about what's happening in the economy. God has an answer for that. In our text this morning, we read that the abundance or the, and the obedience are connected, as is disobedience and disaster. Let me say that again. Obedience and abundance are connected, as is dis- disobedience and disaster. He told them, Moses told them, you have two choices. Choose wisely. If you ever go on your computer and use your computer to do Bible study, what I did when I was looking at this text was I did a search of the word if in this chapter. Did you notice I mentioned it to you many times? If, so let's talk about a few ifs from our text today. The promises that Moses lists in Deuteronomy 30 were contingent on a few ifs. So let's look at them together. First of all, he says this, if you return to the Lord. You see that in verse 2 in your Bibles? If at that time you and your children return to the Lord your God, and if you obey with all your heart and all your soul and all the commands I have given to you, then the Lord will restore your fortunes. You know, the wonderful thing about being alive and understanding the gospel is that God is a God of second chances. You can really blow it, And still turn around and return to the Lord. And if we were to have an open mic today, there might be many people today who would come up and say, this was where I was at in life, and then God intervened, and this is where I'm at. Look, just like my snowmobile being stuck in the ditch, the quickest way back is simply to turn around. You ever stop and think about that? The quickest way back is to simply turn around. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says this, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but He will heal us. He has injured us, but He will bind up our wounds. The Greek term for repentance, metatonia, denotes a change of mind, a reorientation, a fundamental change transformation of outlook of man's vision of the world and of himself and a new way of loving others and God now here's the thing I'm going to step on all of our toes simultaneously and tell you this pride and repentance cannot coexist pride and repentance cannot coexist do you know what a form of pride is excuses justifying something. Lord, I am this way because. That sounds very noble and, you know, meek and whatever word you want to put on it, but it's pride. It's pride. It's saying that God's hand cannot reach as far as you. 
That's what we're saying. I like what D.L. Moody said this. He said this, God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. Some of you didn't get it. Let me say it again. God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. Can I tell you something? You're wrong most of the time. I'm wrong most of the time. Have you done any, any research on cognitive dissonance? Have you looked at how we frame a world around these ideas and values that we believe, and many times they're just plain wrong? You see, there has to be a spirit inside of us if we're going to go on with the Lord that says, I am going to humble myself before the Lord each and every day. And I'm going to assume I'm wrong about something, right? The longer you're married, hopefully, the slower you speak. Now, what I don't recommend is saying, get behind me, Satan, while you're looking at your spouse. <laughs> don't do that. Sometimes in my position, in my role as a pastor, people ask me really hard questions. And I'm coming to the point where I am completely and 100% comfortable saying, I don't know. I don't know. We live in a world today that is afraid of saying what they don't know, and yet we know we only use 10% at most of our brain. We're not, we're not firing on all cylinders. And by the way, the older that you get and the more you have cognitive decline, the higher probability that what you're saying is probably not 100% accurate. So my question to you from this is very simple. Are you full of yourself? Right? Repentance and pride cannot coexist. The beginning of a new year is a great time to humble ourselves before the Lord and turn to Him. I don't know if any of you have watched that movie, um, Father, what's it called? What's the new one with... Father Stu. There's a lot of swearing in it. Great movie. You should watch it. It's a profound movie. We also went and saw The Bells on Christmas Day. Great movie. It really makes you stop and ask yourself the question, who do I think I am? Right? God's in charge, not me. God's in charge. Secondly, he says this, if you obey his voice. Look at verse 10 of, 30, of chapter 30. The Lord your God will delight in you if you obey his voice. I, I've been saying this a lot here at, uh, on Sunday mornings, but there are more voices than ever vying for our attention. A few weeks ago, I talked about this. I said, in the, the day and age that we are living in with the amount of information and knowledge you better have a very strong filter of what you allow to penetrate your heart and your mind. Because there are so many different peoples and ideas and thoughts that are vying for your attention, and they're trying to capture you. I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase now, but this is how the economy works today. Money follows attention. Money follows attention. And so when people are trying to get your attention, it's because there's money attached to it. Turn off the news. Don't listen to the weathermen. Right? Don't listen to what people say that are going to infect your spirit and change your spirit and your meekness before the Lord. Because there are more voices than ever vying for attention, it's more important that we remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said this, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Do you know the best days of my life? When I have quiet, alone time in the morning, and remember, I'm a speck of dust. And I'm not promised tomorrow. And I don't know as much as I think I know. Those of you who are older than me, you say, it's not just gray hairs you're getting, you're getting a little wisdom. Right? 
I don't know. But God is faithful. God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Dallas Willard said this, Our failure to hear his voice when we want to is due to the fact that we do not in general want to hear it. That we want it only when we think we need it. I don't know about you, but sometimes I hesitate to pray because I know exactly what God's going to say. Right? God, what should I do about this jerk? I don't pray those prayers. Because God said, you know what God says. Love your enemies. Pray for them. Especially the ones that intentionally and despitefully use you. Those people need extra prayer. How many got some, don't raise your hand. How many got some of those people in your life? We have to, if we're going to hear the voice of the Lord, we have to be proactive. I hope in your, uh, whatever your time with God looks like, that it involves scripture, it involves being alone, and it involves prayer. I don't really care how you do it. Some people get all worked up about when and how long and, you know, how many times have you read through the Bible, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. I heard someone say this recently. It was so good. It doesn't matter how much of the Bible you read. It it matters how much of the Bible reads you. There's a big difference. There's non-believing New Testament theologians who don't believe the gospel who know a heck of a lot more about the Bible than I do. And so we have to be intentional. Ask yourself this question. How am I taking time to hear his voice? How am I taking time to hear his voice? When Jody's listening to preaching, it's not always mine, and we all have to hear it. Because she doesn't believe in earbuds. So we're getting preached to all the time at our house. Jody has it on. You know, Deuteronomy talks about that earlier in the chapter. In the book, I mean. What did he say? Talk about the scripture. When you're in your home. When you're walking around and you're doing the things you have to do. Put it on the doorposts. Right? Put it on the doorposts. Put it in your bathroom. Some of you, maybe when you go in the bathroom, you have scripture verses on the mirror. Put yourself in a position to hear from God. Finally, he says, if... You love him. I, I said a, a little bit ago that, that repentance and pride can't coexist. But let me just remind you that you can't love God and the world. You can't love God and the world. First John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 says this. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love from, for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. The the most profound scripture that's ever impacted my life this is Matthew chapter from the, the Sermon on the Mount. You can't serve God and the world. It's not that you can't try. You can try, but you can't do it. You can't serve God and the world. You can't love God and the world at the same time. There needs to be a part of you that looks at what's happening that says, Thank God this is not all there is. Thank God that there's more that we get to experience. And you and I have the choice, as as Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 30 today, the choice is ours. Will we return to the Lord? Will we obey His voice? And will we love Him more than ever in this new year? So here's what I want to ask you today. Instead of thinking about the changes you want to make to your life in the, new year, ask, in the new year, ask yourself this question. Who am I serving? Who am I serving? We all have to serve 
somebody. You've probably heard that before. It was in a song, I believe. You're going to have to serve somebody. Amen? Who is the Lord of your life? I know it's church and we all want to go, Jesus, like Sunday school. But seriously, who is the Lord of your life? Who is the master over your emotions? Who is the master over your financial decisions? Who is the master over how you treat your wife? Who is the master over how you use the internet? Who is the Lord of your life? Because it matters. Because at the start of this new year, we need to ask ourselves this question. Who am I going to serve in the new year? You and I don't know what this year holds. We have no clue. We have no idea. God does. God knows. And so as we enter into this new year, as we sit in this position that we're in today, we have to ask ourselves, who are we going to serve? As we close, as we close, um, I want us to just think about our, our, our church here today. If this is not your home church, those of you watching online, think about your home church. I want to plant this thought in your heart today as we close. We've talked today about decisions and choices, right? Moses says, these are the choices that you have. You can serve God or you can serve the world. You can't do both. But I want to remind you of something today. Our individual decisions, actions, and choices affect those around us. No man is an island. No man is an island. And so you and I, the individual choices, the individual decisions that we make, whether or not we exercise wisdom or foolishness, it affects the people around us. It affects your church family. It really does. And so I want to say something bold here today. If you are not interested in serving and loving Jesus, this church is not for you. End of story. Period. If you're here for some other reason, maybe it's social, maybe it's, you know, you want a a feel-good experience on Sunday mornings, this church is not for you. Because we want to be a church where God has the preeminence. Jesus is Lord of our church. We want to be a church where when we come together, we say, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Just like King Jehoshaphat. We want to be joined together in that way. Where we say, Lord, our eyes are on you in this new year. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can't lose. But if we take our eyes off of him, we're already sunk. That's the reality. And how you choose today, those of you who are part of our church, what you choose affects all of us. What you choose affects your family. Your family is affected. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. Lord, I pray this morning that you would open up our hearts to this text of Scripture that we've looked at today, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Lord, help us throughout this week, maybe even go back and look at this text on our own and maybe do a deep dive Bible study on it. But Lord, I pray that for our families that and for our church that we would be people who are humble, people who want to hear your voice, and people who love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, thank you for speaking to us this morning. We honor you in this place. We give you praise for who you are. And Lord, we give you permission. We give you permission to redirect our steps, to show us where we're missing the mark and we need to turn back and go to where you are. We love you this morning. We praise you for who you are and we give you praise in Jesus' name.
And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you. Uh, have a great Sunday. Rest of your week. If you need prayer, we'll have some people here to pray with you in the altar. Otherwise, we'll see you next Sunday morning at 1030. God bless you.